the buttons are more sped up. So this is the Weeding the World Operations Call on Wednesday, December 8th, uh, 2021. Um, and yesterday I had a, a nice uh, Zoom interview with Jesse Engel, um, which I posted in raw format on YouTube unlisted uh, because it is now fodder for a new episode. Um, I am, uh, I'm supposed to talk, have another interview with Daryl Davis tomorrow. Um, Daryl is a personal hero. Um, he responded to my entreaties to friend up on LinkedIn. And then I said, Hey, could I interview? And he was like, yep. Uh, yesterday he was in Berlin about to fly home. And I wrote him and said, uh, you know, we still, uh, Thursday was just a placeholder. And he's like, yep, Thursday's fine. So I'm like, Awesome. So, so we're trying to settle down on the exact time so that Stacy, so that I can put a you know a word out and see who else wants to come, even though it'll kind of be short notice. But I'm expecting. I haven't checked all my emails yet, so I'm I'm hoping to to figure that out right now, uh, right after this call. Um, did you want to put um, Did you want to put an RSV pace so that you could limit the yes. size? <laughs> well, also kind of so I know whom to expect. Um, I think that would be good. Just let you know. Let me know out of. Uh, let me know with an email or something like that would be great. It's a good idea. And so that will give us um, two more raw files to mess with, which means then there's like sort of I think the way I'm thinking about it, there's sort of four episodes of regular episodes of Weaving the World waiting to be produced. Um, and I now have uh, Wendy. Uh, you don't know this, but I spent the last since Monday morning. I've been on tenterhooks because. Uh, I, I used some of the grant monies from Jim Rutt Foundation to buy a new machine to upgrade so that, so that my machine wouldn't, uh, Pete and I were busy trying to use Descript, which we think is going to be like a great way to create a good transcript. And it was comical, like, like I would click on a word, you know, double click on a word in the, in the, in the transcript, in Descript. And then like 15 seconds later, it would say, oh, you want to do something with this? And we were both like, okay, so this is unworkable. Um, and uh, for a variety of other reasons, including uh, I am now going to play with some uh, virtual backgrounds, not I'm going to get away from uh, Mordor and uh, move more toward like sharing my brain live uh, behind me and other and other kinds of stuff. Uh, and we also yesterday, was it just yesterday? No, it was Monday. We had as a guest uh, Michael Benigno who works at Flow Immersive doing AR visualizations, uh, which is a separate little story. And, and they do nice work. I, I like what they're doing a lot. And he's lovely. He was just great. He was just totally in and, and generous and helpful and all that and gave good demo. Um, but one of the things that Flow Immersive did was they modified OBS, which is a complicated but very powerful uh, virtual studio for, for podcasting and, and video producing and show actually live show running. Uh, but it's open source. So they modified it, I think, to a skinny down version, which they now offer on their website as just something to offer the community, which I, I want to compare to mm -hmm and a couple other virtual cams. And then I just want to get good at one of them. Um, also, I don't think I need this, but um, David Bovell has a little $100 uh, keypad, which is sort of like a live product producer switcher that lets you switch feeds and mix and match and stuff like that. I don't think I need that, um, but I just want to sort of think through, partly I'm trying to think through for, um, for the episodes, for the composting calls that happen afterward, for collaboration, for live conversations in context, what's the right format? And, and I, I don't know. So, so part of the reason to, to play with those things is, um, to figure out what actually starts to work better. And with the old machine, I couldn't, I couldn't run mm -hmm, and do Zoom and use my brain or whatever else. Uh, so now I've got some capacity. Oh, and Pete, I wanted to ask you what the utilities were that were that you were that you had installed on the menu bar to monitor CPU usage, et cetera, et cetera, because I'd love to have an idea as well. And uh, I can do that whenever. Um, so anyway, that, that's like the status, uh, the, the current status. Pete and I spent a good amount of time um, on a project plan and working toward merging. Uh, the idea here is to, um, as soon as possible, uh, merge my human efforts with Pete's efforts at automation of the process of going from, hey, you've got a file to download from Zoom, 
all the way to a produced episode that's on a web page on a web on the uh, weavingtheworld.org website um, with whatever that whatever stuff we think uh, is useful around that and after that. With that, I will hit pause. And Pete, do you want to update it all? Uh, no. <laughs> all right. Um, any questions from anyone? I, I actually have a quick one. I yes. going back through something. Um, there's a different Zoom recording. Uh, there's there's a number of Zoom recording things. Um, uh, the one I tried yesterday was called Grain, or is called Grain, um, and it logs in a separate user, um, and then that user, um, you know, shows up as a person, but that the the thumbnail is Pete is recording, you know, this call. Um, it does, well, I don't know. The idea is that, you're, that during the call, you click a button, you say, oh, this was a really cool part. And mm -hmm. uh, it'll actually grab that part. I think it might start transcribing it. Um, it grabs it and it's ready to send a link to a, a little snippet of video, even during the call. Um, so it's, it's meant for, it, the use case, I'm not sure that I would feel very comfortable inviting another Pete uh, to a Thursday OGM call, but um, but uh, modulo that, uh, the use case is for kind of like OGM kinds of calls, uh, Thursday calls where, you know, it's like, wow, that was really, you know, that was really smart. Uh, it also does transcription. Um, all of my playing with it yesterday was kind of messed up with uh, AWS, the AWS outage. Um, they, they were impacted by that. And so a lot of the wow. features were kind of clunky and they, you know, it, it didn't say that at the time, but afterwards yep. I got an email saying, by the way, if, if you had a less than stellar experience today, it was, you know, our, our use of AWS was problematic. What's AWS? Um, AWS is... Uh, um, Amazon uh, Web Services. Yeah, it's it's uh, Amazon's backend for a lot of a lot of web stuff, a lot of it. So so Amazon has basically virtualized a data center, like like whatever a corporation might need for data stuff. Uh, Bezos gave a command fifteen years ago, twelve years ago, somewhere around there. He gave this edict that said, "Hey, from now on, when you need something from a different department that's informational, you're not allowed to just say, hey, go do this for me custom. You have to figure out, is this a regular recurring thing and write an API for it? An API is an application programming interface, which is a way of telling two programs to talk to each other. So, so an API might be, hey, I need the sales report printed two up uh, with you know, custom headers. And, and each of those is a field in the API that specifies some activity, except AWS is like insanely complex and you could build an entire company never, never buying any, any IT infrastructure and using engineering your, your company to use AWS soup to nuts. And you would have lots of your bases covered in a way. And then you would be vulnerable to Amazon's ability to keep AWS running consistently all the time. And they've had a couple of really big outages. Uh, I, I would say that completely differently. Um, oh, good, good. Please. That last part, uh, uh, and I'll I'll get to this. I'll back up a little bit. So there's two parts to Amazon. One of them is running the the shopping service, um, uh, and that need, there's a lot of software that it needs, and all of that stuff is built by APIs and things like that. Um, it's almost sep It is kind of separate. Um, they also needed like servers and all the services that serve servers provide. Um, I think of it kind of like if Amazon were a supermarket, you can think of the supermarket, you know, front of house, there's like shelves and, and goods. Back of house, there's like a loading dock and pallets and things that move pallets around and uh, shipping, you know, shipping containers and, you know, a lot of stuff that makes all of the operations of the front of house work. So AWS is kind of the back of house for Amazon and it's the back of house for many, many, many um, uh, big and small uh, companies on the web. So there's only a, a few big web providers, web service providers. One of them is Amazon, then there's Google, then there's um, Microsoft, Azure, Microsoft uh, Azure. IBM. And 
Amazon is is right up there. AWS is right up there. AWS so, is huge. Um, the uh, it, it and it's funny. I was just reading a couple of days ago. Somebody was like, you know, AWS gets the credit for making all the money for Amazon, um, and it's kind of a, a faint um, because it's something they can say, oh, look over there, we're doing this cool thing that's actually providing a lot of value for stuff. Um, and they, they're reasonably open about how much money is going through that thing, and it's a lot, right? Um, the thing that it's a sleight of hand for is the amount of money they're making on the um, retail side, um, skimming off the top of the, the tiny little retailers that run a bunch of the Amazon marketplace, right? So they don't want you to see that. So it's like, oh, yeah, we're making a lot of money on AWS, and they don't say anything about that. The money they're they're making on top of uh, small retail. I, I just googled it, and the estimate is that uh, AWS accounted for twelve percent of Amazon's total revenue, and nearly forty-seven percent of Amazon's overall operating income. This is just from an external commentator, so we don't know how reliable it is. But what you said makes sense. So the the you're you're not at the mercy of AWS's uh, operations um, when you're setting up your your company. It's it's commonly said that way. It's like, oh, if you set up on AWS, you have to worry that AWS is going to fall over and then your business is hosed. It's the that's the wrong way to set up your business. Amazon just provides a bunch of building block services. And on top of that, they are really good at making sure that you have purview and control of those services. And they're also really good at, they, Amazon is all over the world. Amazon, AWS is all over the world. There's three or four, five, six, depending on how you count, data center operations in the US. And then there's you know one in lots of different countries in the world, um, one or two. Um, but when you set up a service, AWS makes it super simple. Well, as, as super simple as it can be for you to go, okay, my service is running in uh, Ohio and Virginia and Oregon and Northern California. Um, and if uh, the one, that, it was the one in Virginia that was the, and the old, the oldest one, the one in Virginia was the one that had trouble um, yesterday. Uh, AWS presents a lot of capability for you to go, ah, eh, I don't care. Um, it, you know, all this, all the services routed themselves over to Oregon without me doing anything or knowing about it or caring about it or my customers caring. So whenever a company and um, Grain did a pretty good job of this in their email, they said, um, you know, AWS Virginia fell over yesterday and that impacted our services and we need to do a better job of making sure that if one availability zone falls over, it doesn't affect all of us. So. Hold on. Um, um, the, the really funny part of the AWS outage yesterday was that a bunch of the support services for AWS itself, um, them knowing what's, what's up and what's down and being able to tell customers about it, is running in Virginia and wasn't decentralized. So they had a big, a bunch of the techs, tech people on Twitter yesterday were making fun of AWS for falling prey to their own non-decentralization of uh, services that they should have decentralized, which was which was fun. In that was a nice, that was a good description. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I knew pieces of that, but not, you know, not everything yeah, yeah. tied together, which you do so well all the time. Thank you. <laughs> you do. So yesterday it was, uh, I, I, actually there weren't many people pulling their ha hair out. The, the ones I saw pulling their hair out where it's like, okay, so I guess my Roomba runs on AWS and you know, poor little Roombas were running around and, and they couldn't contact the cloud. So they didn't know how to get to the charging dock. So they were running out of juice and you know, people's televisions and you know, all kinds of like, like IOT-ish kinds of things that depend on the cloud stopped working kind of. Um, luckily, there weren't a lot of people going. Oh my God, my whole service is down, and, and I'm screwed. Um, and the other, the other set of people, uh, tech people on Twitter, is like, "Oh, it's like a snow day for you know for IT people because you can't do anything because your services are down." I'm looking for a good article for why it went down. I don't know. I, it was uh, no, <laughs> the the wording was actually really funny. Um, it was something about uh, the availability of some networking devices was compromised or something like that. So 
I, you know, you can think of, okay, well, like all the chips in the network devices blew up or something, um, or somebody tripped over a cord or. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't and, know. and a part of the massive engineering effort that is AWS is like good graceful failover. So that when anything happens in any, in any corner of it, that the services keep finding resources to run. And every now and then they don't do it right. And uh, you know, Facebook had a big fail recently because somebody misconfigured a routing server <clears throat> and that just like took them down hard for a day, uh, including, including Instagram and WhatsApp. It was really bad. It was like a major, major screw up. Okay. Uh, any other questions about the tutorial on AWS and how that works? That's good. Yeah, I actually have one more, which is either going to be a really interesting in-depth question or a stupid question. I'm not sure. Go. Oh. <laughs> when when um, blockchain, right? When when we start seeing kind of a second version of an internet running in the background kind of thing comes along, help me out. Like, is that a replacement for all this kind of stuff or? Like, is, is that kind of a parallel thing that, that's going to end up happening one day? Or is it, you still need things like AWS for that? Um, Do you blockchain know? itself. Hang on just a second. Yeah. He's having a trouble with the actual analog, uh, yeah. analog parts of Pete. Um, um, there's, there's something in that question, um, but it's, it's not quite blockchain. Blockchain is... Uh, it's a service that runs on things like AWS services. Um, okay. Uh, uh, blockchain is, uh, you can, I think, I, I have a thing to say, and I'm fact checking it in my head. Um, blockchain, when you say blockchain, it's basically a database. Um, okay, that uh, makes sense. So it's a decentralized database. Oh, we <laughs> Except um, Sauron has a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think like thinking, I think blockchain is a database is a concatenation of records, but thinking of it as a database, I think is really like off because it is an incredibly slow database that you don't want to put much of anything into. You only want to put like the key to the, to the last big block of database stuff that you did in an actual database somewhere else. You might want to okay, put, well, like, I mean, key, right. Okay. So hollow chain or, you know, I mean, <clears throat> so the, the the other part of your yeah I mean I mean the pony inside your question I I have to share my my a, a, a thing that's been going around on Twitter it's super funny go for it um and it's uh is this the it's, uh, urinal? it's basically it's basically what oh. uh, Jerry was saying um, <laughs> he says hi I'm from the future here's a slide pitch from a deck a, a <laughs> hot new startup. Um, so we leverage an open source technology <laughs> called SQL. Um, it's millions of times faster than common blockchain technologies. It allows us to do innovative things like delete data. Delete data. It's centralized, <laughs> which makes it dramatically easier to maintain. So this, this is describing 40 or 50 year old technology, database technology, mm -hmm. um, SQL mm -hmm. databases. It is millions of times, literally millions of times faster than mm -hmm. as a database. Yeah. And yeah. You, know, you can do other things that are useful. That's um, why it's funny, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and also database experts have spent 50 years tuning databases to be super high performance, very reliable, yeah, sure. uh, fail safe, you know, mirrorable, all that kind of, kind of stuff. And, and here comes a bunch of people thinking they're just going to use blockchain for that. And that that's like not actually true or doable. It's, right. right. It's not efficient. There's Absolutely nothing not beneficial. Efficient. Right. Exactly. So imagine if you had a recipe to make muffins and every time you wanted to drop a spoonful of flour into the bowl. You had to check with hundred people first. And you had to you had to run to Safeway, and then they had to go to the mill, and then they had to go like run run the combine over the field like fifty times. You had to consult then, with twenty thousand other people before you could do it. And, and then mill mill the grain, and then come back, and then like put it back into your spoon, yeah. right? That, that's that's kind of it. that's kind of what blockchain is doing. Yeah, I meant more. So you know, I don't maybe blockchain I don't have the database. right word for it's, it. It's a very specialized <laughs> database, um, and it's yeah. useful. Um, a, a couple of replies to that one. The, the, the three in Web3 stands for latency, um, or uh, it's the number of requests it can handle per second. Um, <laughs> Ethereum uh, handles like 15 <laughs> requests per second. It's amazing. Um, uh, anyway, there, there is a pony in your question, which is the Web3 thing, this whole decentralized internet thing. Yeah, um, yeah. uh, if I've got a bunch of holoports, um, you know, uh, so. Um, I'm, I'm not 
quite up on all of my holo technology, but a holo port is a little box that you plug into your router and to your power, and then people can use little bits of the computing power on it um, to power the holo, holo sphere or whatever. Um, uh, that is a replacement more or less for um, an AWS data center. Yeah, okay. you could use the holo computing environment rather than AWS. And um, and if I pull the plug on my holoport, there's 10,000 or 100,000 other holoports, um, and you wouldn't even notice. To pick up the, the slack, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's I guess the, it's the same kind of thing with blockchain. It's kind of the blockchain version of AWS, right? Um, it's it's going to be slower and um, clunkier and, you know, more distributed, which is a good and bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's just in some of the conversation I've been having, they're talk, they're using the word blockchain, but they really mean something more along the lines of hollow chain. Yeah. So that's kind of why I use that word, but yeah. A small yeah. side note, um, in the early days of um, the inner tubes, the inner tubes suddenly, as it got popular, the inner tubes suddenly started getting slow and everybody's like, ah, crap, this thing won't scale. And this dude named Van Jacobson invented a way to compress the headers on TCP IP messages and sort of solve that bottleneck importantly in the early days of the inner tube. So that was he, that was one person who came up with a clever solution that solved what looked like a scaling problem for the early internet. Mm. There's a bunch of people like, like sitting, I think like mm. this in rooms everywhere thinking, <clears throat> okay, so the blockchain is really energy consumptive and it's going to burn up the earth. And Pete can point to what's her name's uh, essay. Um, has a really interesting name. I don't remember anymore. Uh, okay, I, I, can, I, can, look it I up. can I can look it up too. Uh, yeah. Anyway, there's a great essay which is like, this is all completely irresponsible. We're destroying the earth. Like, stop, yeah. stop using blockchainy sort of things. Yeah, yeah. And then proof of stake, proof of work, and a bunch of other variants that are trying to say, how do we do this actually ecologically soundly? Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. more more quickly because any kind of proof of for every transaction is like you've got to run to the Safeway and they've got to run to the field and run the combine. Right, right, right. Right. right? That, yeah. That's what, that's there's what there's one company I, I've been talking to called Quisnet that, um, that seems to have done it. Now, I don't know enough about the tech to, to dive in, but um, they've been working on it for 10 or 12 years. So 2020, I think of them as pretty new. This one, right? Uh, Chris Bijou, Molly Sargent? I don't know, because I'm not, uh, all I can see is a, a cool ribbony kind of background without any brain. Let's, let's click on, oh, you're not seeing my brain? Mm -mm. No, we're just seeing your desktop. Oh, so right now you are not actually seeing the brain? No. Oh, that completely sucks. Because I'm sitting here screen sharing, thinking I've been showing you my brain. Uh, no, but it's a pretty ribbon <laughs> background. <laughs> oh, so I have to solve for that because usually when I do exactly this, you see my brain, and I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't actually understand why it's not showing you my brain. Uh oh. Yeah, it says it. The the top nav says the brain. Yeah. But there's nothing. But you're, there's nothing in the screen. I wonder wow. um, if it's uh, uh, screen recording permissions or something. Uh, that's mm. possible. Yeah. But I, but I'm screen, it's not stopping me when I do screen sharing to get permissions again on this new machine. Yeah. Okay. Must troubleshoot. Damn. Okay. That, that was, uh, I thought it was running just fine. And I thought you guys saw my screen sharing a couple of times. We, and... we thought you were being weird or trying to get to the point where you were screen sharing, but you weren't. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> okay. And I had no idea. Um, thanks for the link to the crypto art thing. All right, I got to figure out what's what's broken there. Yeah. Um, so were you look were you about to go look for the website? Is that what you want? Uh, no, I was just going to show you Quiznet. Yeah, uh, the, the Quiznet in my brain, and then I launched the website and just to see if that was exact if that was the uh, the right the company you're talking about exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so Pete, do you want to screen share the project plan? Is that a good way for us to make progress here? Yeah. Yeah, what are your next steps going forward? Is it more, <clears throat> and is that in the is that what you want to cover? Like, yeah. what are you hoping to get out of today? Yeah. So what I'd like How to do, help you? what I want to do is the do the simplest thing that could possibly work to stand up some episodes, including some <clears throat> what we're I guess I guess calling composting episodes, which is the you know there's a normal string of episodes that look and smell like podcasts, and mm -hmm. then there's these backup episodes or secondary episodes. And there might be one, there might be several, I don't know, because mm -hmm. if we were to do this seriously and really try to undertake the task, like the galactic, the, the galactic encyclopedia, 
this could unfold kind of, you know, uh, recursively in some strange ways. Um, so we have no intention of doing that. We're just trying to, to, to take small bites out of the problem. Uh, so I'd like to stand up three, four, uh, three, four regular episodes. And if tomorrow I have the interview with Daryl, then I'll have the materials for four episodes, four regular episodes. But I have, I have, in, I have uh, in, convoked none of the composting episodes. So I need to invite OGMers to show up to view an original episode and then say, oh, okay, here's what was covered. Here's, you know, here's uh, what we could add to it. And then see what different people mapping in different tools think about it and then build toward the shared memory that we've been trying to work towards slowly over time. Uh, and in the meantime, Pete is uh, trying to automate as much of the process in the background. Uh, and then there's two different layers there. One is the simple thing about how do we get a, a, an episode page standing with a, a clean transcript of the episode, a link to the to the audio recording uh, on some podcast service, a link to the video on YouTube and some metadata and room for probably at the bottom, but uh, room for the other stuff that comes out of the composting call. Meaning anybody who comes up with a chart that has a URL, we can drop it in a shared Google drive. And we, you know, it could be a scalpel diagram uh, just like Pete just showed. And that would be linked to on the bottom of the episode page. So there's that. And then Pete went and Craved, we're sort of calling it uh, the Thursday call on the metaverse uh, that we had a couple of weeks ago. And he spent a bunch of time of, of like sweat and effort uh, building out individual pages for the things referenced in the call and, and sort of really kind of creating in one directory on a separate vault uh, in, uh, in Obsidian, uh, really kind of building out a, a, a mini wiki for the episode uh, with a bunch of resources and coming soon pages and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so the question then is, gosh, okay, um, how much of that is automatable? Don't know. How do we do this as a crowd? How do we, you know, you've seen the, the videos of fire ants eating a lizard. That's probably a bad analogy, <clears throat> but, but how do we crowdsource uh, building, you know, feeding the fungus in this way? If that okay. makes sense. <clears throat> uh, because, because then what we wanna do is invite other communities and other people who are enthusiastic context weavers and mappers and whatnot in, to sit and work with us and go crazy doing this and lather, rinse, repeat, mm -hmm. right? And, and, then, and then like, like, the, the, like the call with Jesse was really interesting because he and Good Workhouse are doing a whole bunch of interesting things in DAOs and NFTs to try to fund Haitian artists and other artists. Uh, their second, the Pete, their second season, their thinking is gonna be working with incarcerated artists uh, in California. Uh, and so they, they just kind of want to be the, the starting node of a bunch of, of, of goodness that rolls out uh, from the work that they're doing. And I, I'm really interested in a mind meld or an action meld or something like that with what they're doing, because a, a lot of it uh, feels, and then this is, I think, Pete's instinct, um, uh, feels like things we ought to be doing uh, from the so, connections to art and artists to <clears throat> the infrastructure and other sorts of things that are, that are happening there. Go ahead, Wendy. Yeah, it just occurred to me <clears throat> that let's say there's a hundred episodes out, right? And I just I just stumble across one of them. What would be interesting to me, so I came in kind of from the side, right? What would be interesting to me is to have some way to follow a thread. Absolutely. Right? Like I loved this. So I was just thinking as you were talking, like what would that thread be? I think it would be less interesting to have a thread as a topic because so many things are already done by topic. I think it might be interesting since we're trying to um, weave something new and we're not sure what that new thing will be. We wanna encourage something to emerge is to ask a question mm -hmm. and to say, these are all starting to answer part of that question or, right? And what do you think about that? So I was just about to screen share and then I realized, oh, you can't see my brain. Um, yeah, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I can't. I mean, it, 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 won't, it won't help because um, you can't see my brain yet and I have to troubleshoot that. Uh, so 
When I'm busy doing my weaving in the brain, which is just one of hopefully many different expressions of this, I'm okay. I'm actively looking for the threads you're looking you're talking about. Yeah. And the one the one obvious thread is, hey, these are all episodes of weaving the world, and they're all going to be connected up to weaving the world, and they're all going to be in row in order by date order of the episodes or numeric order, you know, episode, season one, episode one, kind of kind of numbering, right? Right. So they'll all be in that order by default, which is that's easy. A little right. bit of a timeline and is really simple. And that will be mirrored on the web website, so you'll be able to navigate that way. But then we're going to tag things up, so you'll be able to navigate uh, through tag space. But then, as we start to connect narratives, I'm busy. Like when I talk to uh, uh, Daryl tomorrow, I'm really sort of trying to, I'm trying to digest and weave uh, what causes people to change their minds who have like pretty what we think of as pretty radical or just dangerous views. And, and how do you pacify and connect with them and all about trust and respect and dignity and, and all of those are, are, are narratives. And what I do in my brain is I create simple thought names that are collective, that are, that are more important nodes, which I usually color purple, that are kind of opinionated. And those become threads you can follow. So, so with luck, Every episode will have lots of little tendrils and trailers and dendrites to, 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 to channel Judy, um, sort of dendrites to uh, the connective stories, similar things, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and in, in a perfect world, every episode is a gateway drug to the larger woven set of uh, background context story, et cetera. Does that make sense? It does. So what I heard and what you said, though, was it was a question, which was how do we get people to change their minds? Yes. Right. right. Which, which is different a than question. a statement like neuroplasticity is the way to make new and understanding neuroplasticity is the way to understand how to create new thinking, right? Like, so, but, but not different from connected to, so under how do people change their minds, there would be something about neuroplasticity exactly. and changing your mind. Then there's, then there's a thing about recovering from trauma to change your mind. Then there's a thing about logic and debate to change your mind. And those are all merely different ways of changing one's mind, right? And then there might be some editorial opinion about, you know, all, all this stuff about debate and logic is kind of pales in comparison to having dinner with somebody and getting to know them and then like bringing them to some new thing, which is what I would sort right. of say. I I think what the question offers, and, and we'll have to, I mean, I don't think this is an answer necessarily yet. Yeah. It's something to play with, is that it, it invites um, answers to the question from different disciplines. Yes. Right. Instead of it all kind of siloed, if, if depending on how we phrase a statement, it could more easily get siloed, all the, all the related things can get more easily siloed in one area or one discipline. And I think the <laughs> beauty of what you're doing is the potential for weaving in stuff from all these different areas, right? You could have well, using, not saying you want to go here, but just as an example, right? Using um, ayahuasca can help change yeah. your mind, right? Like on things or help you give you a new perspective, right? So it just, it invites more gives you more room to have met someone and say, oh, now that fits in and how that makes sense to your audience and that have your audience go, where did he just go there? That makes no sense. Absolutely. Ab absolutely. Entirely. Yes, totally. Um, Dr. Dress, you had a, a comment <laughs> or a question? Yes. Um, <laughs> I was wondering for the <laughs> compost, <laughs> it threw me off. I think, off. I think honorifics are really important. So <laughs> for the compost are you episode, thinking? I was just I was just wondering, what about if we hired one or two editors, people with the like the, the technical skills, where we could, even if we went in two different directions, work with us. Like I don't know if you've ever you probably haven't watched Cupcake Wars, but I if have, I could just because my, nie my nieces were mad about cupcake wars like four years ago. So I have unfortunately Perfect. watched a couple episodes of Cupcake Wars. Perfect. So you know what the what? they get people that can create exactly what they're envisioning in their mind. They might not have been able to create those scenes, but they can envision it. And I'm thinking of sort of like the OGM crew is sort of directing the editors what they want to say. And maybe we, I mean, I think that could be interesting in itself. But maybe I'm, I don't know. What no, do you that, think? I, I like the idea. So I'm I'm on the verge of trying to figure out how do we how do we hire somebody 
specifically to perfect the transcripts. Right. Because I have a funny feeling that descript or no descript, going back and actually making a clean transcript, and there's different degrees of clean, is going to be a very time consuming job. Not, not a hard job. Like if, if Pete or I sat down with the transcript and applied some time, it would melt like boom, boom, boom. And it'd be really pretty at the end because we've both done that in other cases, but we both are really wildly aware that this is insanely time consuming. Um, and the good news about Descript is that it, it shortens so many parts of that task, especially once your machine catches up with you. Uh, but we may want need to hire somebody only for that task uh, on an as needed basis. Now, what you're saying is different from that. So I wanna come back and ask what you mean by editors doing which particular kinds of work in the middle here. Okay, yeah, so first, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead, just Wayne. offer up a phrase. Yeah, like yeah, I may, it might be that you mean content manager. No, I mean somebody who has, actually has the skill so that if we say, you know what, we put this clip over here, put this here, like where, like it's almost like, again, I'm thinking of this as almost like a reality game of ordinary people creating this thing together. Um, but the other thing I wanna say, which sounds so different from what we're used to is that the way our world is structured now, we think of like, less jobs and saving money as a good thing. But we're, I think we're actually trying to do something different because we're looking to spread. So I would say the more jobs we create, the better. Instead of looking at the cost of it, looking at is engaging people as the value. You mean as part of creating, as part of feeding the fungus and doing our, our work, Correct. the more people we hire, the better? Is that what, sort of what you're saying? Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, I like that. Uh, uh, and then a bit of what you just said. So Pete is like his radar for new tools and other kinds of things is, is phenomenal. And on Mattermost a couple of days ago, he pointed us to what's it called? Touch something? Touch designer. <clears throat> Touch designer, um, which is being used to do crazy ass modern shows on Twitch TV and other kinds of places because you can use it to create animations on screen and a whole bunch of other funky stuff. And then he just pointed us to Grain, which feels to me like a feature posing as a company because uh, it, it does one thing really nicely that shouldn't actually be a company for $15 a month, right? It, it does transcription. I, I didn't get to try it. But, trans, but transcription is something you can cut a license with Otter and like offer for just about anywhere, right? Um... I'm, I'm just saying it doesn't. It's it doesn't. like uh, if if uh, it's the like if you said, oh, there's Zoom and there's uh, or you know there's call recordings. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that you would invent out of that is Descript, and then another thing is Grain. Grain, oh, totally, and exactly. Grain, Grain actually does what it does better than Descript, right? Yes. It's like I want you know these. Uh, they call them stories, you know. This is a highlight, this is a highlight, this is a highlight, this is a highlight, it's a story done. Well, right? and probably they're architecting it to feed into Facebook stories, Instagram stories, whatever. Mm. And, and they're like, hey, there's lots of people making Zoom. Let's write some software that can makes that little bridge, right? Which is great, yeah. except from my perspective, it's a feature posing as a company. <laughs> uh, but, but also, um, Stacy, in an ideal world, there are 50 participants or 20 participants on a, on a, in a really interesting conversation six of whom are busy weaving stuff using mind mappy or, or, or Romy, you know, textual tools or whatever else, or, or uh, Mark Carranza and MX. And then every now and then 12 of us tap a button or click something on our screen that says that was really noteworthy. And, and there's something that detects that 12 of us did that at this moment. And it goes and it finds what that clip is mm. and automatically does what, what grain does and says, Ooh, I've just made a pretty clip out of the place where everybody went, everybody went, ooh, this was cool. Um, I've just created a clip for y'all and go crazy po reposting it anywhere you want because here's a, here's a link, which is a shorthand direct link to that episode, that little event, that little thing you liked. And if you want, you can stretch the, you could, you could stretch the boundaries of it because maybe the automation didn't quite understand properly what the boundaries were, but it's trying. It's like, it's noticing maybe topic shifts, right? Mm -hmm. And when we, when we opened into a topic and that would be, and right this minute, um, we could do that manually, but it would be an enormous amount of work to go back and find the clip, like editing, editing video and audio <clears throat> is a, this huge time sink because it's temporal. Right. You have to go back. You have to go back. You have to listen to it when it's done. You have to, you know, check and, and recheck it, it. 
that reminds me of, I think it's on Coursera. When you watch a lesson or a video there, you get to press a like, you know, basically a heart. And then the next person to see it, it aggregates those so that you see on the, on the progress bar at the bottom on, I don't know what that's called actually, but the timestamp bar on the bottom where the most people hit hearts. So you can just kind of like fast after a while, you can just fast forward to the part. That's actually and, a great shortcut. That's a great shortcut. Uh, where, where did you see that? I what think it's Coursera. <clears throat> Do you know, okay, so are you familiar with Coursera? I'm familiar, but I've never taken a course on yeah, it. Yeah, so okay. I don't, so, I, don't, I, don't you, I mean, a lot of them are free. Yeah. But maybe it wasn't. It was something, it was either, and it's not you to me, I don't think. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Coursera. Cool. Um, Pete, do you want to riff on your your comment on Wendy's thought? Yeah, the, um, uh, another way to think of what, what Wendy suggested, the suggestion of like, how do you create a through line um, through a bunch of things is, is smart, I think. And framing it as answers to a question, I think is really smart. Um, Keep going, I was gonna, it, I was gonna it reminded thing, me I don't of, want to interrupt you. of this sort <clears throat> I bumped into today, um, even though it's from July. Um, uh, somebody, somebody felt like he was a really bad storyteller and then, and then he taught himself how to be, what, what good storytellers do. Um, to create a, an engaging narrative. Um, and it's, I mean, it's stuff that you, we, we should kind of know, but it's also good stuff to remember. So a couple thoughts on top of that. Um, story threading is all about turning exactly this act into a career, you know, doing, doing the work to tell stories over, over other matter, other materials, other things that got said. Then um, long ago, I did the video on uh, nuggets, narratives, and points of view. Uh, is this familiar to all of you? Pete, Pete remembers it. Let me, I can do it in 30 seconds. A nugget is any addressable piece of content. A tweet is a nugget, but a whole book can be a nugget, but really you kind of want this paragraph in the middle of the book. Uh, a video can be a nugget, but really you want this clip. So that's the nugget, right? So nuggets exist in the world. Narratives tie together nuggets. So I want to create a narrative that says, hey, here's why I think that we went into the, the, the great, uh, the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. And I would construct a narrative that assembled a bunch of wise things I found, nuggets that I found already published. And then I would create a few of the nuggets myself and put them into the world so that other people might weave with them. So the narrative can be retrospective or prospective, like here's what I think we need to do policy-wise to get out of the global financial crisis right now, or here's what we missed, or an analysis or whatever like that. And so a narrative, uh, is, is, is a story of the kind that I think we're talking about here. And then a point of view is a collection of narratives. And so um, Stacy might publish a narrative about how to create engaging shows uh, that change people's minds online. And I might just include her whole narrative as part of my point of view, because I'm like, that was awesome. Stacy speaks for me. And everything she said in that thing is perfect. Or that, except I would subtract this one thing, you would, you would offer some editorial. But you, you would collect a bunch of narratives and you wouldn't have to originate all the narratives. Your, your point of view on some domain, some field of, of endeavor would just be like, I believe these things to be true. Like, like th these narratives express what I, how I think the world works, what I think is going on. And the narrative might be that, that you know, the world is run by a bunch of democratic pedophiles who drink children's blood and are running the world from you know, Comet Pizza's basement. Um, that, that could in fact be the narratives because people are busy inventing those narrative threads and putting them in the world in exactly this way, right? Uh, and so Nuggets, Narratives and Points of View is an attempt to say, this is a really good way of the future of expression and media and books and movies because any of the nuggets is reusable in many different narratives and points of view. And a good nugget serves multiple purposes. A, a really good nugget is a triple word score because I used it to say the global financial crisis, Wendy used it to explain Bitcoin and somebody else used it to do something else. That's a really juicy nugget. And hopefully it would be sort of voted up and hopefully the author would get some NFT tokens minted for them and make a fortune from like the, the, the best nuggets in the world. But that's a dreamland, a dreamscape. Go ahead, Wendy. Yeah. So. This is what I was thinking of when I was sharing with you guys that this, I mean, this goes back, right? The data, the information, data, knowledge sets, wisdom thing, right? To me, the that's very similar, pyramid. right? Or is it yep. not? Because uh, I know that oversimplifies it and that's old 
information, you know, sent into the field, but so, to me that, you know, so, the new words are interesting because yeah. it gets us away from kind of a colder version and into more of a storytelling version, which I like very much. And Pete and I, I think, I, I'm speaking for you, Pete, so you'll correct me, but I think Pete and I both have a, a slight adverse reaction to the DIKW pyramid. I could and, tell, though. <laughs> I don't. You don't? Okay. Well, I okay. sort of do because, because like Maslow's pyramid, it gets misused a whole bunch. Sure. That's right. True. And and my my mentor at Penn, uh, Ross Acoff, was one of the people who were, might might be the progenitor of the DIKW pyramid. He has some paternity in it because that was part of his field back in the 40s, I think. Mm-hmm. Um um, and so, so yes, actually, because in, in some way, these stories are our attempts to distill wisdom out of, and the nuggets live at lower levels in that, in that pyramid. Uh, although a really good nugget contains wisdom, it's just that it's wisdom about a very specific. That's thing. why I like it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. right. <clears throat> yeah. So when I was writing up, remember, I wrote up something based on the, the video of Neil Postman talking, right. And I was trying to get at the same thing, right? How do we, how do we weave something? How do we now take this kind of iteration of a pyramid and say, but right now we, what we want to do is we want to bring this stuff together in a way that eventually gets us to some semblance of wisdom. So what I love about nuggets is you're basically saying there's something embedded in this small little thing that has value. It's not just a piece of information. This, this, this piece of information has more value than a different piece of information. They're not equal because it's a nugget. (laughs) Yeah, it's value to change the words like that. I like it. Uh, Stacy. So this may not be the nuggets that you're looking for, but I'm always thinking about like the beginner's mind. So for this call, Pete's answer on what AWS is, to me, that's a nugget. And I actually think there's a whole audience, not that you guys are familiar with, but that I know that would love that nugget in three minutes. Mm hmm. Absolutely. And that's why Definitely. if there was, if there were people that had, you know, I don't know how to pull that out and do it, but so I know P- how to say that's a good one. So <laughs> Pete's explanation right. of AWS a moment ago would make a perfect nugget. Right. 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 And if we had a beautiful AI system that when the three of us were like, oh, that's a nugget, please, please AI, go find this thing and sort it out. You know, that would be really pretty cool. Right. Or we get to the end of something and somebody says, yeah, the last two minutes of conversation. Boop. Yep. And I'm <laughs> going to swap. Because You kind of don't know it until it's done. It's not like you can highlight it before it happens. You kind of get to the end, like you were saying, Jerry, yep. before and, and kind of go, ooh, that was good. That last couple minutes worth of conversation. If only there were a service where something was logged into Zoom and recording. Exactly. And then you could go back and like snap this. Part. Exactly. That's great. Yeah. So I've got to switch places, but keep going. Uh, Stacey, what, what you, I, the, that AWS, you know, AWS thing was a nugget. It sounds okay. a lot like five minute universe. Okay. It's a three minute university. <laughs> but the, here's the thing. If we're counting on the automation for, you know, 10 people to click a heart, that's great. But what about the beginner that's not there? What about having actual beginners decide what the nuggets are? Because I don't know how many people would, I mean, I I don't know. Most people, as far as technology in this area, know more than I do. So something that they might not think is worthy of, you know, pulling out, I would think is worthy of pulling out. I don't know. That makes sense. Yeah. But then to me, you're talking about the next layer. Whereas this is valuable for this audience. Yes. Right? Yes. So exactly. this is valuable is currently not, even in the example I gave, is not tagged by who's listening or like what type of audience it might be valuable for. Um, but that could be easily another layer, presuming that we wave magic wands and we can do all the things that we want to do. But I love that, right? <clears throat> and presumably if it, if it somehow, if say one clip, let's say this whole conversation was available and 
people who are more tech inclined listen to it, they, to your point, wouldn't necessarily tag that one. And then let's say for some reason, it went into a thread that eventually got connected to something else, which had a bunch of beginners listening to it. And they started tagging something totally different. I, I can, I, that's what I love. Yes. Right. We just, that's what we want to have happen. That doesn't mean it needs to happen at the beginning when it was first posted. It means that the capability has to happen for things to evolve over time, right? And for it to still be available and not siloed in, oh, this is only a good video for people who are want to listen to how to weave things better. This is also a good video for people who want to, you know, listen to how tech works the, in ways they didn't necessarily know, right? So <clears throat> to me, that's, that's, that's the beauty ultimately of <laughs> where we could go with this. You know, it doesn't have to, we don't have to force the videos on, I guess, in my view, I always thought it's not like you have to force the videos on different audiences. They will find it eventually. My apologies for being out for the last couple of minutes. April's having a small crisis because she's traveling on Saturday for a week and needs to get a visa for which she needs the results from Kaiser of a COVID test she took yesterday, which turned out negative, except the QR code for that isn't working. So I've got to troubleshoot that in a moment. Um, anyway. So what did I miss? You uh, solved it, right? You, you missed the us talking about how it, how it would be great that every nugget could also be tagged for the audience that might benefit mo the most from it. And every audience could do their own tagging. I mean, like, 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 like hypothesis, oh, we were just saying too, like yeah. hypothesis, which is sort of this, you know, a shadow internet where you can attach comments to any web page. Um, you could attach shadow tag clouds that are relevant to whatever the audience might be mm -hmm. um, and tag things up for your people. And then the AI could say, oh, other people in your audience really like this and this is new. So suggestion for you today Bingo. to watch this or to connect it into your personal brain or whatever. <clears throat> exactly. Yes. Um, okay. Well, actually, actually let, me, uh, let me try to rest control of the call. Oh, excellent. There's a coup. One of my you favorite know, I'm trying to get uh, used to coups because we're in the middle of a rolling coup from Trump. So we better yeah. get accustomed to this. Uh, one of my favorite topics, by the way, is uh, ferrous metallurgy and what? the history of it. Um, anyway. Do you uh, mean alchemy kind of stuff or just no, metal? This is, this is actually, it's not even just metal. It's just iron, uh, iron okay. and steel, um, mm -hmm. which is totally fascinating. And there's some really cool sub stories in here. Um, anyway, uh, that's not what I was resting control for. Oh, I, darn. I, I liked this diagram and um, it's missing some things. Um, uh, I also want to make sure that, so we kind of briefly looked at this um, workflow diagram. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that I hope we leave this call with is a, a couple. So uh, this, this is kind of like a map of the things we could start to automate. Um, uh, Jerry um, generously, that's the wrong adjective, but generously said, I'm trying to automate as much of this as possible, mm -hmm. um, which is not quite true. It's more like we have mapped many things that we could automate. Um, and I've also come to the realization that there's no sense in trying to automate all of this before we start doing stuff. So mm -hmm. the, the main thing that I, I think the next steps are um, doing a little bit little bits of this by hand um, with uh, you know the the things that we've got here um, and Jerry I wonder what part of where I was going with this is there's Jesse there's the craft call there's and two more people uh, Daryl uh, Daryl Davis D -R D -R -R -Y -L. Uh, one R or two one R uh, Davis and and the other one uh, Jesse Davis, Jesse. Sorry, and the other, the other two, the other two episodes. You mean? I, I feel like you have four. There are Michael. four. Yeah. So what the metaverse? Uh, actually, the the metaverse call, and then the betterverse call after that. Oh. Some seg some segment of each, not the whole calls. This, do you think of this as the metaverse call? Yes. The one that. Okay. That's correct. So you've already got like a bunch on the on the first one. And then the Betterverse call, which you can link also to the Metaverse call because it was like a follow-on. It was a sequel to the, to the Metaverse call. Yes, and those I'm thinking of as the first four episodes. Gotcha. Um, okay, so I, th I think the next step, um, 
uh, going back to our, our friend Adina, um, uh, it doesn't make sense to, she, she had a, a rule of three uh, thing. Um, when you see something three times, then it starts to be a, a feature that you can talk about. Um, kind of the same thing. You, we want to do, do things a couple times by hand and then observe what we mm. did and then automate them. Um, so the next step is deciding, you know, one or two of these to work on and then do the next steps of them. Um, uh, uh, which also means um, standing up a web page for the episode somewhere and embedding it on the website somehow, whether we do it, you know, manually or whatever, but getting that done. Uh, but the reason I was sort of emphasizing automation is wouldn't it be great to do it the first time in a way that's automatically replicable and you know so that you, we could stand up new calls quickly and new pages quickly and directories quickly because that's I'm that, all for automation but we yeah. don't know what to automate yet um, yeah or we don't know where to allocate our limited uh, automation resources, resources okay cool and wasn't there another you were talking about um, a Michael from flow immersive? Uh, yes, that but that was not. But that was not an episode. I wasn't thinking of that as an episode of Weaving the World. Although we could easily convene one around the stuff that he's got. Yeah, I mean, his 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 AR visualization technology is is interesting in that way that we could, you know, if we had somebody with a data set, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that would make a really interesting call. And if he were up for it. And Jay, was that an FTP call or was it? Uh, that was that was this that was this Monday's FTP call. Um, Wendy, you should make sure to find that recording and watch it. I can find it and give you a link to it right now. Be great, yeah. Yeah. I, I think you. It, I it's think not you what do you want, it. but it's really cool and um, might feed into what you want. Yeah. And the video is unlisted because I unlist the FJB calls only. Those are the only ones of the. <clears throat> there's the link to the YouTube. And I think you'll enjoy what he presents. He doesn't present it until the last 10 minutes of the, of the call. So if you want to scrub through until you see him uh, doing stuff, uh, the rest of the call is good too. Okay, last 10 minutes. Yep. This is the, um, the, the thing to look for is uh, visualized data oh, whoops. Uh, in the background. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go. <laughs> it's all right. Um, the, uh, his Instagram account is cool too. And he's got a cool um, AR AR representation of, he's got his uh, wife, the mother of their new kid, um, and in the living room or something like that. And behind her, alongside her, is the AR representation of data, um, uh, quantified self data. Yeah, diaper changes that. and breastfeedings. Yeah. And uh, that, that one went viral, and, and uh, it's, it's an engaging, cute little thing. And, and the thing I, I offered him toward the end of the call, uh, what is interesting to me in retrospect through this conversation about storytelling, which is I mentioned to him that in that short video of his wife explaining what happened, she makes the point at the end and just kind of in passing, doesn't make any big deal out of it, that here in the data, these, these brighter points are when uh, Michael started doing night feedings, which was a big change in the routine and allowed her to get more sleep. And so, so for me, otherwise, it's just a cloud of data that's like the rhythmic pattern of diaper changes and breastfeedings, and it should look like rhythmic patterns, and it's not interesting because it's just a rhythmic pattern of something going on. The shifts in behavior, like, oh, then he, then he was able to, to use a bottle at night uh, and, you know, or, or whatever, and that, that created a benefit. There's a story there, and that's really interesting, and there the data really stands out and works beautifully. And, and they sort of told it in passing, and I'm like, that's kind of where your story is, right? How, how do you actually draw the spotlight to that and then lather, rinse, repeat and go deeper on that? Really good observation. Because mm -hmm. because that's when the light bulb went off in my head. Up until that moment, I was like, in the, my little inner, inner script was going like, beautiful, nicely done, yeah, yeah, yeah. It just looks like the cloud of data you would expect from baby behavior that somebody went and actually measured and, and, and tabulated and then visualized. So. Um, I have another diagram to show real quick. Cool. Uh, this is kind of, this is Stacy and, and me working together, um, uh, looking at weaving the world um, and podcasting in general, actually. Um, so uh, so what's, the, what's the first call, Jerry? And what are the next steps? Um, 
for, by first call, you mean what is the sequence of episodes? Uh, well, which, epi which episode are we going to produce next, actually, is the, the yeah, question yeah. I care well, about. Well, if we did it, if we did it in, in order of what I imagine would happen, it would be uh, Metaverse, Betterverse, uh, Daryl, Jesse. Um, I think that Jesse, I, I think that Good Work House is on a timeline. And I would do. Oh, and we need to actually produce that quickly. Um, yeah. Good point. And I said we would do something quickly for him, although I wasn't thinking in terms of all the stuff we want to do. I was thinking of just putting up the episode, you know, cleaning yeah, it up yeah. a, a little bit. Um, yeah. But then if we cleaned it up a little bit. And uh, so, OK, so kind of what that means is I have to figure out what an intro and outro look like. And we, we have to figure out what an end screen looks like. End screen, not essential. But if this is an, if this thing is going to look like a video podcast, it needs a, an intro and an outro. And then. I don't know that there's stuff inside the episode that I want to edit out because the, one of the questions is what level of production quality are we looking for here? Um, at, at very high levels of production quality that involves intense editing and also layering in of graphics and other kinds of things, which at this moment, we're, I don't think we're gonna spend uh, uh, any, any effort on. If there were some hiccup in the middle, somebody knocks on the door and you go get a package, then you'd wanna cut that out. That'd be easy to find. Nothing like that happened while uh, Jesse and I were talking. Uh, he's, he's got a message to you um, in our shared channel. Uh, yep. This this topic, by the way, let's not let's not uh, publish that. So there oh. is so there is editing. Recorded? Okay, so something that's on the recording he wants clipped out. Well, I don't know if it's on the recording or not, but there's okay. there's a topic not to cover, uh, not to Good. share. And and small side note, um, at the beginning of the recording, he was in this large empty room with a light over his head, and I could barely see his face. I'm like, do you mind moving somewhere where I see you know where you have more light on your face? And he's like. Hold on a second. He goes next door into a gallery space that is, uh, well, has been fed and built by this guy, Jim, his name is in, is in my notes, um, for 35 years. And it's full of objects of art. And he gives me a tour and I don't have the recording on. But in the meantime, he's saying things that are probably not like, should, shouldn't really show up on the recording. Um, but, but it's beautiful and I'm like, Oh man, should should have started recording when I said, "Do you mind moving to a place where we get more light on your face?" Because that that whole piece of it, we could have elided some of what he said. But that whole piece of it was magical because the space. He just he just you know turns his turns his uh, uh, device around and it's like showing me. I, I'm like he's he's entering a wonderland. This is a godforsaken wonderland. Uh, anyway, so I missed all of that. So when when he's sitting there in front of something, that's just like a wee little piece. Of, of the space that he's actually in. Uh, anyway, small small side note and and missed opportunity in some sense. I'm like, oh, heartbroken that we didn't do that. I could also ask him to go back and do a quick visual yeah. tour uh, and drop that in. Anyway, in terms of next actions, I need to create an intro. I think it's important that I create an intro and an outro and that I edit those together onto the video of, of Jesse and my talking and then kind of post that and then we sort of say say here jesse you can use this any way you want to and then we look at that and say okay what does that mean for uh, weaving the world like like uh, how much more do we need before this smells like an episode and then my next step is to invite people to watch that and come into a composting episode so that we have our first uh, follow-up episode where, where we have more people mapping weaving doing whatever so I think that's I think that's the next sequence of steps. Am I am I missing stuff? What would you change? Um, I've got another thing, but but Stacy, how did you grab that as a list, kind of? Um, I, another, I so I think I, I get the production stuff, and then bringing up bringing that in, you know, bringing the output of the production stuff into composting mode. Um, I think there's an I, I there's another set of activities I think of as the marketing plan. Um, how do we tell? How do we let people know that there's composting happening? How do we start to let people know that uh, weaving the world is a thing? And you know, so this is where my uh, old startup uh, muscles are like, oh, there's a social media person posting something to the weaving the world uh, Twitter account and the Instagram account. Sweet. Um, and. Uh, that's crossed with, um, uh, you know, getting in touch with Alex at Good Work House um, and saying, hey, let's do a, a co-brand thing, you know, um, Weaving the World points to Good Work House, Good Work House points to Weaving the World <clears throat> on, on Instagram. Reciprocal yep. advertising. Um, 
Oh, that sounds great. I love it. And to that end, you might want to set a date for um, the weaving conversation. Yes. No, I need to, I think like I should immediately, soon. immediately plan a time, date and time, like Monday afternoon next week. You might want to give people a little more time to make space in their schedule for it. Um, Wednesday. It depends on how many people you want to We're, attend. I kind of would like to do it sooner rather than later, but, but Jesse, I think only needs the original episode. I think that anything we do with compost call is gravy and is our stuff. <clears throat> so that, that, that means it's not as urgent as, you know, Jesse's launch event is the 15th or his soft launch or whatever, Pete. He, yeah. I mean, Mon Monday's fine if, if you're good with just a few people showing up. But there I'm might good. be other people that you would rather, you know, that you want to leave space for, or we could do a week from now. We could do next Wednesday or Thursday. Right. You Every could use this time. I would, fact, uh, Jerry, if I were you, I would do a three minute pitch tomorrow on weaving the world and composting and, um, first episode and on the Thursday call. Yep. Yeah. I like that. And if you have your time ready, then whoever comes, comes. Yeah. Even better. Yeah. So you, that tomorrow you want to announce the time. Yeah. Sounds great. Okay. That'll save you so much time. So stay <laughs> trying to top priority trying to picking a time chase for people the down. Compost call. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Um, awesome. I have to go troubleshoot a QR code. Yes. But um, this has been super productive, and I've learned a lot about how Amazon Web Services works and <laughs> all of that. And and I think our conversation. And I about, had my Lord of the Rings hit for the day. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, glad to provide a little sore on in your life. Yes, um, need it every day. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Got to know which pit of hell to skirt That's and right. fall into. What are we really doing here? That's what we're doing. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. That's why this is the Fellowship of the Ring. That's exactly. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but who's, oh, what's his name? Dweezil? No. Who's uh, my precious? What's the character's name? Gollum. Gollum. I'm like, it's not Dweezil. Gollum, thank you. Who's Gollum? That's a that's a new one. <laughs> yeah, Dweezil, I think, is a character. Dweezil is Frank Zappa's son's name. Yeah, correct. Interesting. Yeah, um, Cause, cause just he quick. just mentioned Frank Zappa, and I'm like, how did Dweezil work its way into my yeah, head? Yeah, that, maybe that's how. <laughs> that's how. Stacy, just real quick, I want to make sure I have everything on the list. I have intro, outro, contacting Alex, and the time for the compost call, the pitch for tomorrow. Those Anything all else? Good. Uh, there's an there's an end screen. Uh, I need to do some editing of the intro. I, I need to edit together the intro, outro, video, and post them and send that to Jesse and say, "Here you go, use this." And Jerry, this the this even like the first production of that video does that go up on the Weaving the World website? Yes. So I, I think that's another thing, Stacy. Posting that, be, that becomes. Sorry, I, missed, I was writing. Say the last thing. Uh, posting the episode to the website. Which means building a web page for the episode and starting to do that, but okay. min minimally, web page on website for the episode and the episode video posted there. That's that's like. And I have part. a question about that. How, yes. how long? Did, how long does something like that take? Four days and about five hundred people. No, really. <laughs> um, about half an hour. About half. Is that something that you can do on share screen if I was watching or no? Yes. I would love to, if, if Jerry, if that's okay with you, I would love that. If, and whenever you want to do it, let me know. I, so when I'm working on this, I will ping you and we can co-screen, we can co-work on it if you want. That's easy, easy to do. And I now have apparently a much faster machine that doesn't like screen sharing my brain, but I'll, I got to fix that. So I, I think that's a screen share permissions thing. I think you're right, Pete. So I'll, I'll reboot and then I'll look at that, see if that works. Thank but you. Thank you all. Cheers. Good luck. I really with appreciate the it. Code. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye.